I'm Bruce Fumi. When it comes to Highland clearances, the thing that strikes me is that the man most vilified today is the Marquis of Stafford. Already one of the wealthiest men in England, his marriage gained him vast swathes of the north of Scotland, from which he banished huge numbers of locals across an ocean, was rewarded with the title Duke of Sutherland, and whose wife had him immortalised in a 30 metre statue at the top of Ben Vraggy, so that even in death he could tower aloof over the people of Sutherland as he had done in life. But today I want to take you a little deeper into the story and reveal some of the other characters who didn't stand quite so distant and aloof, but eagerly got their avaricious hands dirty. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right hand side of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Here in Sutherland, there are coastal shorelines where the North Sea sucks water through the squiggly straws of the Burns, Rivers and Highland Straths. Brora, Kildonan, Neva. I'm going to take you up one of those beautiful fertile Highland Straths where in the early 19th century people reared cattle as they had done for generations. Despite occasional bad years of harvest and hunger, they generally had surplus to export elsewhere. Life was hard but rustic. Those inland valleys were certainly preferable to living along the Sutherland coast, where rocky crags clung desperately to a thin layer of soil, playing a constant tug of war with North Sea winds, and not always winning. But the harsh tranquility of Sutherland life was about to meet the malign benevolence of improvement. In May 1809, a boat arrived in Dunrobin Bay, which shares its name with this castle, the home to Earl and Lady Stafford when they were in Scotland. In that boat were two men called William Young and Patrick Seller. Their plan was to set up a ferry service from here across to Burghead and Murray, and to tap the Staffords for some capital to set up this business, bringing increased trade from which they would benefit. But when Young and Seller got here, they realised that for them, there was an opportunity far greater. Carpetbaggers in the southern states, white men in West Africa, asset stripping venture capitalists in, name your location, William Young and Patrick Seller. They smelled cash. There was a mismatch between this world and theirs, and they were just the men to exploit it. This is Strathkildonan. When William Young reconnoitred it, he reckoned there were 1,200 to 1,500 people, with countless more cattle living in the various straths and glens. All of them would have to go. And so one of the wealthiest men in Britain was presented with a series of proposals by Young and Seller to show how he could become even more wealthy. Ironically, they weren't even sheepish about it. It meant that the less wealthy would have to be evicted. They wouldn't be allowed to bid to rent the land that they already farmed. They could be moved to those rocky coasts and given a couple of acres. Yes! they'd have to sell their cattle, and yes, they'd have to give up their homes and transport their furniture along non-existent roads, but they could learn and become fishermen. Why farm the tranquil, fair Elstrathical Donnan when you can brave the North Sea? They could go off and become coal miners, whiskey makers, factory workers. A few might even stay in the area, but instead of working their own land, they would work as wage labourers on the large sheep farms that Young and Seller would set up. The first victim wasn't one of these crofters, but the Sutherland estate's previous factor, who was promptly sacked and replaced by Young and Seller. Now the previous factor had already tentatively towed the improvement sheep dip, which had left the locals with a bad taste in their mouth. A couple of years before, two large farms had been rented out to shepherds from Northumbria in the north of England. One here at Suiskill. 
So when on the 5th of January 1813, three men came up the Strath surveying a new sheep run, the locals were alarmed. The men were Major William Clunes, retired from the British Army. He'd been wounded in several campaigns before influenced by the Countess at Dunrobin Castle had persuaded his superiors to release him to take up his father's tenancy on the coast before the old man passed. As part of the new broom sweeping through the Sutherland Strass, he'd been offered more land to farm sheep just to the east of us. And with Major Clunes came Ralph Reed, the younger brother of one of those earlier shepherds, and another man, James Hall. Of course, daylight hours in Sutherland in January were too short to carry out the whole survey, and so Major Clunes, Reed and Hall bid each other a good night and arranged to meet again on the morrow. A local would have said, Languages as incomprehensible to each other as their mindset. The two men headed here to lodge at the large sheep farm already established at Shushkill. Major William Clunes came to receive hospitality from the minister of the parish church here, here in the local manse. Not only the biggest house in the area, but the only house for miles around with a slate roof. He'd hardly settled his horse and got his backside in a chair when there was a knock at the door. Who can be calling at the manse at this hour on a winter's night? Now, you might expect if the door knocked unexpected like that, that when you went to the door, there would be three wee monkeys. One with a trumpet, one with a drum, and one with a pancake stuck to its bum. Or is that a Perthshire thing? Tell me in the description below, right? Not in the comments section, right? Do you recognise that rhyme? Are there regional variations and differences? Anyway, January was too early in the year for pancakes. It was, in fact, four men and a woman from the Strath to ask Clunes what he'd been up to that day with these English folk. Did he plan to take on the land? Had he already made such an arrangement? What were his intentions? They couldn't see his father, who'd been well respected in the area, behaving like this. They appealed to his better nature, but in case of any doubt, left with a warning that if sheep were put in the land, there would be blood. And don't think your musical monkeys are going to protect you either. Is that a pancake? The next morning, when Clunes left the manse to set out on his horse, he found himself out here, down here, surrounded by 50 men, all armed with sticks. The spokesperson who tried to reason with Major Clunes was one of the elders of the local kirk, described by the minister as the most attractive Christian character. But whether or not Major Clunes was planning to continue his survey, things were already being decided for him. Because meanwhile, Back here, a few miles up the road at Shushkill Farm, at the junction of River Helmsdale and the Shushkill Burn that runs into it, a young lad he called Donald Gunn had come to the door of the farmhouse before breakfast time. He said that he was searching for a horse that had gone missing and had they seen it. But he also made sure to find out whether Reed and Hall were still in the house. And having asked his questions, he didn't set off looking for his lost horse. He went down to the land by the stream here and started playing shinty with his pals. He said during the night, people had gone all round the strath warning that the shepherds were here. Now one local woman, Jean Murray, who ran the local Shabin on the other side of the burn, sneaked into the farmhouse under some pretext to warn the two shepherds to hightail it out of there. But not to mention that the warning had come from her. Now, the fact that we know her name suggests she wasn't the only grass in the village. Reed and Hall rushed the horse and instead of turning east and going back down towards the coast, they hightailed it, being chased up by 50 to 60 men in this direction and they didn't stop until they got to Caithness. Having missed their prey, the locals headed for the farmhouse. Some of the group that had accosted Major Clunes down the strath earlier, they were also arriving by this stage. The English-speaking outsiders left in the farmhouse were terrified for their lives, but eventually the hundred or so raging farmers were calmed by a spokesman. 
translations were made and one shepherd was ordered out of Sutherland never to return, whilst those remaining were dispersed elsewhere away from the farm for safety. For what happened next, let me take you back to Golsby. Now, I should say that if you want more details on these events, then you'll be able to get them in the fantastic book called Set Adrift Upon the World. Link in the description below, obviously. But it seemed that previously enthusiastic sheep farmers weren't quite so enthusiastic. Major William Clunes, a veteran of several British Army campaigns, made excuses to Young and Seller that he couldn't move forward in the tenancy of this new sheep farm at present because he was suddenly confined to bed with a fever, possibly brought on by eating a dodgy pancake. If I said chocolate covered, would that... You're right, you're right, okay. Reed took to stay in Dunrobin Castle and suggested that Young and Seller and their bosses, the Marquis and Countess, might need to look for another tenant. But that wasn't the end of things. This is Gosby Inn. Now today in April 2021, it's been recently taken over and renovated by a mate of mine. Well, he's, he's in the middle of upgrades and renovations right now to get it ready for post-COVID opening. Back in 1813, it was called the Sutherland Arms. Now, if you're ever up this way, I suggest that you pop in for a drink, a meal, or an overnight stay, because this historical location is where events culminated. To find out what happened, you'll need to check out this channel or this link here at any time after the 3rd of April 2021. I'll see you in that video. In the meantime, Hamian Dawkins is going to be Lama alive. Cheerio and